Lots of A-level students think they know everything there is to know about the water cycle, but on this spec we need to know about the cryospheric processes. Cryos comes from a Greek word meaning cold. So it's all the cold areas of this world. These cold areas, where are they? Well, you'll be familiar with the idea that we find at high latitudes, so the North Pole and the South Pole, we find areas of sea ice at the North Pole, we find areas of permafrost, and we find the Greenland ice sheet all in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, we have a very large ice sheet covering Antarctica. We also find at lower latitudes, but high altitudes, so high up mountains, we find snow and ice as well. So for example, Mount Kilimanjaro, also covered with snow um, and ice. The cryosphere is where the cryospheric processes take place, and there are six major elements to the cryosphere. Firstly, sea ice, which forms, uh, as we just mentioned, in the Arctic, or should form in the Arctic in winter. And that's decreasing volumes of sea ice forming, and we'll come on to think about what that, what that causes. Secondly, permafrost, permanently frozen ground, for example, in northern Russia and Siberia. Thirdly, icebergs, which break off ice sheets, which are found, for example, here and here, and break off the terminus, the end of glaciers which are discharging into the sea. We've also got all the snow which is found on Earth, and we've also got all the land-based glaciers here, the Jungfrau Gletscher, the Jungfrau Glacier in Switzerland. Like all parts of the water cycle on Earth, cryospheric processes operate in a system of inputs and outputs. Here we have the process of accumulation, snowfall, freezing, avalanching onto glaciers. These are areas of net ice accumulation where ice is building up. But we also have losses and those are called ablation. Ablation, the loss of um, ice through sublimation, through melting, through runoff or through icebergs calving into the ocean. These processes traditionally have been in a seasonal um, balance. So it's such that in the winter we have net process of accumulation and in summer we have a um, net process of ablation, losses and more in summer in the Northern Hemisphere. But unfortunately, over the last 30 years, we've got increasingly warming oceans and warming um, sea surface temperatures and warming air temperatures, which are leading to um, net losses to the world's ice masses. Here's an example down at 74 degrees south in, the, in Antarctica. We've got the Nansen ice shelf and you can see some evidence of the ablation processes taking place in this image. So you can see a very large meltwater stream which is running off the front of the ice shelf into the sea ice here and um, into the ocean. So this is actually the edge of the ocean, this is the sea ice. Just like rivers flow downhill, ice also flows downhill. So from the centre of the Antarctic ice cap Ice is flowing downhill towards the ocean, towards the southern ocean. We have, um, at the centre of the ice cap, we have slow flow, but as it reaches the edge of the ice cap, the flow starts to speed up. Um, the gradient increases and we get stretching and cracking of the ice, which sometimes goes all the way through. So at the margin of the um, ice cap, uh, meeting the ocean, we get these crevasses, large crevasses developing, and we get the production of new icebergs, which are a way of keeping the ice mass in balance. We've got area of accumulation here, and then the area of ablation on the edge of the ice mass. What is a concern is that we know that some of the ice shelves, like the Ronnie and the Ross ice shelf and the West Antarctic ice shelf, are at risk of possible sudden collapse. And this is something which scientists have warned about for several decades now, because there is a possibility that a sudden collapse in an ice shelf like that could lead to very sudden sea level rise of more than three and a half metres. Scientists record from space using satellite imagery um, the speed of the glaciers and the ice streams within the ice sheet very closely, and these are very closely monitored. Here you can see the fastest rates of flow in the bright brightest colours. Cryospheric processes are incredibly important for our global earth and life balance, both of the carbon and the water cycle. Let's start in the uh, Arctic, up in the high Arctic, near the North Pole. The situation is we've got increased sea surface temperature. The sea is warming in the Arctic. The waters are less cold. When that happens, we get less formation of sea ice, which has been occurring um, since about 1970. Less sea ice has a dramatic impact on the reflectivity of that area, how much incoming solar radiation is reflected. So you'll know that incoming solar radiation will come in and it will be reflected off ice. 
But you can see between the ice we've got very dark areas. These areas will absorb, of ocean, these areas will absorb incoming solar radiation. Instead of reflecting it, it will be absorbed and will warm the ocean further. So with increased areas of dark open ocean, that will absorb more incoming solar radiation and so will warm the ocean surface. This is an example of positive feedback of runaway change. There are clear links between the water cycle and the carbon cycle if we think about the high Arctic. So here is the North Pole and here is the land which surrounds the North Pole. Here we can see all of northern Russia, uh, Alaska and northern Canada. And these areas of dark purple areas are areas of continuous permafrost, land which has been frozen for more than two years. This land is defrosting and it's melting much faster than models predicted. So, for example, in northern Canada, it's melting something like 70 years earlier than forecast. And this melting is triggering another runaway positive feedback loop in this area of the world, which is affecting the whole Earth. And the runaway feedback loop is happening as follows. As the ice is melting in these areas which were once frozen, it's releasing from the soil a gas called methane. And that methane gas, there are vast stores of it, and that methane gas is being released into the atmosphere. Here you can see the trace with the average running through it of the concentration of methane gas in the atmosphere. And this is starting back in 1980, moving forward to the present day. Methane, which was frozen at depth, is now migrating through the soil and being released into the atmosphere. It's four times as effective as carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So therefore it's creating faster warming in the atmosphere, which is then leading to more melting. So we have melting, release of gas, more heating, therefore more melting. So here we have another example of the link between the carbon and the water cycle in the high Arctic. So it's good to find out more. If you'd like to read two additional resources, go to Stage of the Cryosphere, Google that, or Google um, NASA Sea Ice, and you'll get some fantastic more resources to read about. It's time for review. The cryosphere refers to all the snow and ice found on Earth. Secondly, there's a mass balance. It's a balance between accumulation of snow and ice and ablation or losses of snow and ice. Currently in the high Arctic, we've got very high rates of ablation. Very little inputs, more outputs. So most of the water is moving from being a solid state to being a liquid state. And that's occurring in the permafrost on the land, but it's also occurring in the sea ice. So therefore, the cryospheric processes of the water cycle are becoming more and more important and very important for you to learn about um, because they help you to explain how there's a link between the water cycle on Earth and the carbon cycle on Earth.